All right, well, welcome to the final session of this marriage seminar. We're going to put seven and eight together since we had to cancel last week. But uh, coming home a day late from Belize, just I decided I had way too much on my plate to get ready for Sunday. So, so we're going to compress number seven and uh, give you as much as we can of lesson eight in our uh, material tonight. Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the chance to be here together and once again to revisit the subject of marriage. Lord, we know marriage is extremely important to you. You designed it. You used it as an example of your relationship with Israel and with us as a church. And so we just want to uh, ask this, uh, ask that you would bless this evening. We want to give you the glory for all that we learn and for the things you've written in your word to encourage us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I forgot, I need to stand a little over here so that you can see past me. Okay, in this marriage seminar, we have two questions for tonight. The first one is, what does church have to do with a good marriage? When I attended the uh, seminar in Florida last year, uh, where I was introduced to this, uh, this book that we've been using, and this way of approaching premarital counseling or marriage counseling, I was surprised that he included a chapter on church until I read the chapter and I realized how important church is for a good marriage. And then uh, sorry. And then the second question is, what gives the greatest joy and meaning to intimacy? And uh, that's the final chapter. We usually, when we do premarital counseling, we do that cha that session last, closest to the wedding, so we don't stir up anything. But uh, for you that are married, we want to we want to stir up something. We want to uh, let you know how to improve the sexual area of your life through information from the Word of God. So let's just review. We've had this is the whole plan that we had. Uh, this. Uh, foundation was Jesus Christ at the center, and in each time we gave you a scripture verse, and I want to encourage you to put those verses on cards and to get acquainted with them. Uh, I personally have done this with each verse that we've had in the, in the uh, lesson, and reviewing them every day or almost every day enables us to reconnect with that lesson, even though it's been weeks ago, and let God reteach you in just a little short bit uh, what He taught that time. I don't know if you, I don't, I don't know if I've mentioned it in here, but did you know that Jesus taught a sermon one time with three words? Anybody know what it is? Remember Lot's wife. That's all He had to say because they knew the story. And so as soon as he said that, their minds went back to the story of Lot's wife turning around, looking back at, at uh, Sodom and being turned into a pillar of salt. And immediately they were able to preach themselves the message that came out of that Old Testament story. Jesus used, only used three words. It, it was in the middle of a conversation. And then he went on with other things. The same thing happens when we take these scripture verses and we review them because they get tied back to the lesson. So Christ at the center, we used these passages. This was on... Uh, the Valentine banquet. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those don't sound like marriage verses, but they are. Because if you will put Christ first and then love your neighbor, in this case your spouse, as much as you love yourself, your marriage will take a climb for the better. Then we talked about love, and love turned into service. So we have the verse of Mark 10:45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Every morning when I review that verse, I'm reminded, oh yes, I'm not here for Roycey to please me, I'm here to please her. Um, and the same true for any of the other relationships I have. We moved next to problem solving, and we ended up with Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Particularly, we were looking at let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Take the trash out every day from your marriage. Don't go to sleep until you have resolved 
uh, anything that has come up that day. That has been a, a real blessing for Royce and me in our marriage. Talk next about roles and expectations. And we had two verses for that week, one for wives and one for husbands. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. That verse always surprises me, but uh, God knew that a man can easily develop a bitterness against his wife for any of various things, and so he commands us not to do that. Communication. We spent quite a bit of time on how to communicate. Particularly, we talked about reflective listening, where you you listen to the other person until you can reflect back to them exactly what they said, and they agree that that's what they said, and then you know you have communicated well. And it's amazing in marriage how often when you listen to each other, you can resolve things very easily. Uh, our verse there was James 1, 19 and 20. Uh, Nolan will be speaking these verses to us next Sunday. For from my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Do you believe that in your marriage? Anger will never produce anything godly in your home. We use it to produce things a lot, but it won't produce anything godly. It may get the other person to cooperate, but not in God's way. Then last time we talked about finances. We talked about the rule of balance, the rule of contentment, the rule of stewardship, the rule of generosity, and the rule of management. And I'll just quickly go through some of the major points from last time. Financial failure is when your outgo is greater than your income. And financial success is when your income is greater than your outgo. And that seems very simple, and it used to be in a cash society. But as soon as we added in credit cards or the ability to borrow, now suddenly it's easy to have your income be less than your outgo. We talked about contentment. I used the illustration of three girls looking for dolls for Christmas. The one who wanted the most doll when she got less than she wanted. She's sad. The one who wanted what she got was content. And the one who got more than she anticipated was delighted. We talked about generosity. Ask God to show you a way to give every week. We talked about budgeting. And a lot of people get frustrated with that word. Budgeting is you telling your money where to go ahead of time. Instead of it telling you, oh, no, we went here instead. (laughs) Uh, How to manage that, you want to keep it as simple as possible. There's lots of different ways to keep track of money, but keep it as simple as possible because otherwise it will tend to not happen and not keep up with it. I went through Dave Ramsey's financial baby steps, and I've got them all seven here this time. I I missed one last time. Uh, Save $1,000 in an emergency fund. By the way, if you are in debt and you're overspending, saving $1,000 in an emergency fund will do two things. It will give you some money in the bank that you can use for emergencies, but the second, it will change your spending patterns because you can't overspend and put $1,000 in the bank. You have to change what you're doing in order to get there. Pay off all debts except the mortgage. Save, in addition to the 1000 save three to six months' expenses. Invest 15% for retirement. Plan for your children's education. Doesn't mean you pay for it all, but you plan for it. Pay off your home mortgage. And then step seven is build wealth and give. In other words, that's the point where you are financially free. Everything's paid for. You can now use your income in all the ways, the wonderful ways that you can when the money doesn't have any tags on it. And we use this verse from from, uh, Job. I think it's one of the best financial verses in the Bible. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It acknowledges that everything we have financially um, came from the Lord. And since he gave it to us, he also has the privilege of removing it if he wants to. And our job is just to bless the name of the Lord no matter what happens. We also use this verse from 1 Timothy, which says some of the same things. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. We actually reviewed this verse in Sunday school this morning, 
And as I was preparing, I realized I've always missed the word godliness. A lot of emphasis on contentment as I've thought through these verses. But it says godliness with contentment is great gain. And so we need to uh, work in that area as well. Okay, now to get into tonight's lesson, first of all, I'm going to talk about keeping Jesus Christ at the center of your community. Community is kind of a word that is very common in this generation. It wasn't very common when I was growing up. But community refers to those people around you, those people that you relate to. And so let's add community to that uh, wall we're building. And I want to ask the question, why church? Why is church important to a marriage? Let me give you four reasons. First of all, church, or what we do at church, puts life in God's perspective. It puts life in God's perspective. You can't come and sit through meetings, sing songs, pray, attend class or whatever you do, and fail, at least uh, in a, if the church is doing its job, fail to hear about life from God's perspective. And that's important. We, we think, well, oh, yeah, I know all that stuff, so I don't need to go. But what you're, get, what you're forgetting or what you're missing is the reminders to think about life from God's perspective. And so church is important that way. Second, church surrounds you with support. We've often, I've often noticed people who have, for one reason or another, drifted away from our congregation. And often, I find that later they have also drifted away from the Lord. They've, they've lost their support system that, that helps them. The reason the uh, author of our book suggests that this is important in premarital is that often at marriage, people change locations. And so they lose the support base, the church that they've been attending, and they move to a new community. And he says for a while, because they're so excited about each other and loving each other and stuff like that, they don't miss it. But then after a while, they realize, you know, we don't have, any, we don't have anybody to pray with us. We don't have anybody to encourage us. We don't have anybody to uh, rebuke us if necessary. Third, it encourages you to serve. That'll help you fulfill Mark 10.45 about uh, serving rather than getting. And it should also equip you to serve. So the pur those are all purposes that God has put in the church. So it reminds you, first of all, that God is in control. That's God's perspective on things. Um, I thought this was good. The Holy Spirit won't remind you of something in God's Word you never bothered to learn. <laughs> now, the Holy Spirit is good at bringing back to mind something that you have heard or learned before, but He can't put something in there that's not there. He can't remind you of something you've never put in your mind. So the, the, uh, be, being part of a church, a regular, consistent part of a church family, listening on a regular basis to the Word of God will put those things in your mind. Your own reading, of course, is, helps as well. Then we have prayer at church. Prayer isn't to remind God of what our problems are, to remind our problems who God is. <laughs> and uh, again, you'll lose that perspective if you're not gathered with a body of believers. Um, the, uh, well, we'll get to the verse later, but God never intended Christians to operate as lone rangers. I don't know if you've ever heard this illustration, but try this next time you're sitting around a campfire. You've got all those glowing coals in the campfire. And take one coal out and set it off to the side. What happens? It dies. Now, I haven't as yet found anybody to explain the science of that. <laughs> Here's a coal that can't keep itself going, but when it's put in the fire, it will keep itself going and other people around it. I mean, the, how the community keeps themselves on fire when individually they can't. I, I'm sure there's a scientific principle for that, but uh, uh, we just need that. So here's that encouragement, the support that comes from church. We're gathered around, particularly when we pray for each other. One of the things that I'm very pleased with is that uh, in, our, in our home fellowships and in our Sunday school classes in the morning, in most classes, we've allowed time for prayer. And for people just to say that I have this need or, or I have a friend or loved one with this need and for us to pray, that is really, really important. We encourage one another. 
Uh, the verse that we're going to leave with you as a memory verse or as a, uh, a card verse is Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but, incur but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, church has two aspects to it. We have the joint worship where the whole congregation gathers, and then we have small groups of different kinds. It might be a Sunday school class, a home Bible study, a uh, discipleship group, a uh, men's meeting, ladies' meeting, whatever. Both of those are important. You, you'll get two different kinds of things from the large group and from the small group. So I would encourage you to think through that in your life and say, you know, am I taking advantage of all that God has to offer within our church congregation? And then last, it should equip. Uh, the purpose of the church is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I'm pleased that our church has caught that vision and is finding ways to equip. Okay, that was number seven, abbreviated. But uh, I hope, since, most, since I know all of you are fairly, at least fairly at, um, regular at church attendance, I just wanted to give you some encouragement that, uh, and you're not moving anywhere as far as I know. <laughs> uh, but, but let me just say this, though. If you move, if God seems to be calling you or you have an opportunity to go to another community, may I recommend that the very first thing you do is find out if there's a good church in that community. Because to make a move for a job advancement, or make a move to get closer to family or whatever, and lose a good church environment can be, can be disastrous to your faith. So I'm encouraged with the number of people now who call us or maybe ask me to check another community and find out, you know, what kind of churches are there available. And with the Internet, you can, you can do a lot of research that way. But just think that the first thing you want to find out about in that community is your church home, and then your job and your relations or so on can, can follow after that. It is really important. Okay, let's go to the major subject for tonight. And that's keeping Christ at the center of your intimacy. This is the final block we're going to put in the wall. And we're going to spend most of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We have been married next June 45 years. 44 years. That's right, 44 years. I guess I'm just having so much fun, I want it to go faster. Uh, 44 years, and the second point I'm going to tell you tonight, I didn't learn until about five years ago. And so, I, especially for those of you who have married less than we have, you get a chance for a head start. I want to share two vital statements about intimacy from the text. Let me, let, uh, if you have your Bibles open, let me read with you the first five verses of 1 Corinthians 7. By the way, in the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul is giving information that he wants to communicate to them. Starting with chapter 7, he starts answering questions they have written to him. This is actually 2 Corinthians, by the way. We, uh, Paul wrote four letters, and we have number two and four, but they're called one and two. So... Uh, the reason he's answering questions is because they've already written a letter to him and he's already written a letter to them. So he starts out with chapter 7 saying, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. So that means he's, okay, I'm, I'm going to start answering your questions now. So chapter 7 and on through most of the rest of the book, he's answering specific questions that they have given to him. We don't know what the questions are. We don't have them written, but we can guess at them. And obviously this question was about the whole sexual relation and, and, and marriage in general. So he said, this, you, the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now the word touch there is the standard word for touch, like to reach out and touch something. Um, but the context, we realize Paul is talking about touching with sexual intent or the intent of sexual um, arousal. 
So because in verse 2, he says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication or to avoid the wrong kinds of, of sexual contact, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. A few years ago, I learned that the Greek language doesn't have a word for husband and wife. So literally, here's what this says. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own woman and let every woman have her own man. And when I read it that way, that puts a little special emphasis on it. Out of all the men in the world, you women are to have your one man. And of all the women in the world, you men are to have your one woman. And uh, so it just gives a little bit of different flavor when you read it that way. In verse 3, it says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So 3 through 5 is where we're going to spend a lot of our time tonight. These verses are in the Bible. You've, we, there, there's not any reason that they have gotten skipped, except that two things. One is we don't tend to speak about marriage in a public wedding service, in a public service, because we're talking to a mixed group of families and children and so on. The other thing is that when we talk about it publicly, we tend not to get down to brass tacks because of the nature of the environment. So we're going to do that tonight. Here's the first of the two vital statements about intimacy. Sex is not about performance. Sex is about relationship. If you were to walk through the grocery store and scan the magazine rack, you would find a great number of books or magazines about how to have a better sex life. And all of them talk about performance, or at least most of them do. In other words, how well you're functioning in the different aspects of the sexual relationship. But rather, the scripture says sex is about a relationship. Um, I would like you to hold your place in 1 Corinthians and go back to the Song of Solomon. I was explaining to my son at lunch today that we were going to be in the Song of Solomon today, and he says, that was the book I wasn't supposed to read. He said, when I was growing up, you gave us a, a, a Bible reading program, but we weren't supposed to read the Song of Solomon. <laughs> uh, some people say you shouldn't read it till you're 21. Probably, in some ways, you shouldn't read it till you're married, but uh, Song of Solomon is an amazing book. It is so sexually um, explicit. I, I don't mean explicit in the way we normally talk about it, but it, it, it's so sexually motivated that Bible teachers for years just said, oh, this is about Christ and the church. And uh, in fact, I use a Thompson Chain Bible, and that's how he... Uh, Divide, that's how he interprets it. There may be some application to that, but I believe this book is talking about a real romance between a real man and a real woman. And uh, so I'm going to, if you've got your Bibles, and if you don't have one, there's a, one in the rack in front of you. Men, I would like you to turn to Song of Solomon chapter 7. Song of Solomon chapter 7 and verses 1 through 9. And let me see, women, I would like you to go to Song of Solomon 5, 10 through 16. So you're going to need two Bibles between the two of you. Men, Song, Song of Solomon 7, 1 to 9. And women, so Song of Solomon 5, 10 through 16. Men, 7, 1 to 9. Women, 5, 10 to 16. I want you just to take a moment and read those passages silently to yourself.
see some things happening out there already. <laughs> okay, let me ask you a question. Having read those passages, first of all, you're reading poetry, so you, you're reading word pictures and so on like that. But would you agree that God doesn't attempt to be prudish about the sexual relationship? He's speaking very openly, isn't he? You women are reading a description of a man by his wife, and you men are reading a description of a woman by her husband. Now, what I want you to notice is this. Solomon, this is for you men, is enjoying his wife. He is not enjoying a Hollywood pornographic image and describing that. He is describing his wife. Catch that? So he's using some rather glamorous terms. He's building some word pictures. He's talking very, um, um, I need a different word than explicit, very uh, provocatively and very descriptively, but he's talking about his wife. So Solomon, in Solomon's eyes, she is perfect. In Solomon's eyes, she is intoxicating, which that's a good uh, sexual term. Um, and in Solomon's eyes, she is beautiful. Okay? So men, your wife should become your standard of beauty. By the way, that will change your marriage. If you're not there already, for your wife to become your standard of beauty. Now, because you would started developing your standard of beauty before you met her, you may have to change your standard of beauty. Your wife worries about whether you like her physically. If you will change your standard of beauty to be her, you will begin to approach her and to uh, encourage her that, yes, you are satisfied. You are delighted. Solomon is not delighted with another woman. He's delighted with his own wife. So, what is the height of your ideal woman? What is her hair color? What is her eye color? What is her body shape? What is her dress size? What is her personality? And here's what you do. You fill in your wife's details. Now, that is important. When I got married, I'm going to do some confessing here. When I got married, I did not do that. I had a standard of beauty other than my wife. And so after a few years, she began to notice that when I was in a situation, I was always checking out the other women. Okay, before a few years. <laughs> One day it came to a head, and she approached me about it, and I very stupidly said, well, if I didn't notice women, I never would have noticed you. Do you think that was very encouraging to her? <laughs> I also said, well, I'm a red-blooded American man. Out of that conversation, and it took, a, it took a few conversations, I realized that I had majorly blown it as a husband. I didn't realize that, yes, it's okay to look at other women until you marry one, and then your blinders come on. And I did what uh, was it recommended in one of the Bill Gothard seminars. I wrote a covenant with my eyes. Job, Job 31.1 talks about, Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes, therefore why should I look upon a maid? So I wrote out a biblical covenant about what I was going to do when my attention was attracted to a woman other than Roycey, I gave her a copy, and to the best of my ability, I began to live by that. 
A year and a half later, Roycey and I were driving in the car one day, and she said, you've changed in that, haven't you? And I was so glad to hear that. So, if you were to look over at my wife right now, that's my standard of beauty. Your standard of beauty better be different. <laughs> Your standard of beauty should be sitting beside you. Now, I, I, I'm not just playing with this. This, I think, is a real mental change we need to make, and this is what Solomon is doing. That's why we have this chapter. He's not saying, this is the kind of women I like. He's saying, this is the woman I love. That's why we say it's not about performance, it's about relationship. And he is describing her. He's describing her in a very joyful, a very sexual way, but he's describing her, not the woman next door, not the secretary at the office, not the person on the glamour, uh, in the glamour movie, not a pornographic image he has seen. He is describing his own wife, his own woman, we could say. Men, more than women, although... Uh, that's changing somewhat these days. Men are very easily attracted by sight of a woman. And if that woman has revealing clothing on, or if she fits his standard of beauty more than his wife does, he will be attracted away from his marriage. And God says, no. You've married a woman that woman now needs to become your standard of beauty. Let's say your wife has a birthmark. Well, then that's part of your standard of beauty is a birthmark. Let's say your wife is heavier than she would like to be. That can still be your standard of beauty. There's a very interesting phrase in the Bible. You've probably heard it in other contexts, but in Malachi chapter 6, the very last verse of the, of the New Old Testament, it says that Elijah is going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Now, that's a, per, that's a parenting issue, but let me apply it here. You can turn your heart to your wife and begin to enjoy her beauty, and all of the other women will fade out of the picture but it's going to take an effort. You're going to have to deliberately make your wife the standard of beauty. So you fill in, your, you fill in the details. You can go home and write yourself your standard of beauty for, your, uh, for a woman and fill in your wife's details and then begin to turn your heart toward her romantically and sexually. Okay, women, you read Solomon 5, first song of Solomon 5, 10 to 16. Notice what's happening. Solomon's wife is enjoying him. Not the man across the street. Not her boss at the office. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but pornography is almost as extensive now among women as it is among men. So, that's a danger point for any one of us. God says, okay, enjoy your husband. In your eyes, he is handsome. Now, what happens if you always were looking for a tall, dark, and handsome guy, and you got a short, fatter, sandy-haired guy? You've got to change your standard of beauty, your standard of handsome. In your eyes, he is well-built. Now, some of us guys look at each other and say, I don't think anybody would ever call me well-built. But to my wife, I want to be well-built. I want her to think I'm well-built. I don't have very many hairs on my chest. I want my wife to enjoy that. Even if sometime in the past she was excited by the fact some guy with hair pouring out of his shirt. <coughs> I don't know if that's attractive to a woman or not. <laughs> Fortunately, my wife is shaking her head. <laughs> he is the best of 10,000. 
line 10,000 men up and you should choose your husband out of the list as the best guy you want to relate to. And then she said, he is wholly desirable. Wholly desirable. In some ways, this goes back to the, uh, the, the $20 bill, dollar bill idea that you can assign value that's different than intrinsic value. So if I look at myself in view of the normal American masculine image, I don't come out very well. I'm not a hunter, I'm not a fisherman, I'm not brawny, I'm not particularly tall, but in my wife's eyes, I want to be the most handsome guy on the face of the earth. And she can do that if she sets her mind to that framework. So your husband should become your standard of handsome. Figure out what height is for your handsome, what the hair color, the eye color, what the body muscle is, what the shoe size is, what the personality is, and fill in your husband's details. If you don't do this, by the way, you will be tempted to look at another man or alum, another woman. If you don't settle your focus on the one God has given you and say, this is the one. So I, I, was, I got this idea for the handsome and beauty thing from uh, Heath Lambert. Uh, we heard him at last year out at uh, the Bozeman Counseling Conference. And he was saying, I'm a five foot seven kind of a man. I, I mean, my, how do, how do we put it, his, the, the beauty he was looking for in a woman was five foot seven, brown hair, and he was describing his wife. He said, that's the kind of beauty I, that's the kind of man, that's the kind of beauty I like as, as a man. He wasn't describing someone who was six foot two and blonde and long legs or whatever. He was describing his own wife. So learn to treasure your own wife or your own husband as the epitome of beauty and handsomeness. The epitome of sexual uh, uh, arousal. That's what you want. So sex is not about performance. It's about relationship. God is very concerned about this. We could use God's relationship to Israel as an example. Israel had other gods to choose from. There was Baal, there was Ashtoreth, there were the groves, and, other, and there was Molech. One time one of the kings went to Damascus to Syria after he had conquered Syria, and he finds a, 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 uh, an altar there, and he says, well, I like that altar. Now, that altar was built to serve a foreign god, but he brought that altar home, and guess what? Now he wanted to serve that god that he had, quote, just conquered. And God says, no, you are committing adultery against me. You're supposed to be looking only to me. I'm supposed to be your standard of godliness. Obviously, in this case, God is greater than those other gods. But notice God says, you're supposed to be faithful to me because I am your God. He didn't have any problem, in one sense, with the Ammonites serving Molech, or the Moabites, I think, serving Molech, or the Sidonians serving Baal, because that was their God. But Israel, he said, I want you to pay attention to me. I am your God. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing we're about to go into is the one that I didn't learn until just a few years ago, and it has made a tremendous difference in our marriage, and that's this. Sex is not about your pleasure. Sex is about the other's pleasure. Sex is not about your pleasure. Sex is about the other's pleasure. And by the other, I mean your, your spouse. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me show to you this very carefully through these three verses. Verses 3 through 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. When I first realized this, it changed the way I approach a marriage bedtime. 
Verse 3 says this, Let the husband render or give unto the wife due benevolence. Benevolence is kindness. But notice the word due. The husband is supposed to be giving to his wife something in kindness. He doesn't stop there. He says, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So the first thing we learn here is that the sexual relationship is a duty. It's an obligation. Now, I'm not trying to take the fun out of it. I'm just saying that God says the husband has a responsibility to give to his wife a kindness. And the context here, we're talking about a sexual kindness. Likewise, the wife is supposed to render to her husband due benevolence a sexual kindness. Now, you didn't grow up with that idea. You may not have even gotten married with that idea. I certainly didn't. I thought a lot about sex before I got married, but it was all about what I was going to get, how, what I was going to experience as a result of the sexual relationship. And God says, no, let's turn that around. This is a something you're supposed to give to your wife. Verse 4, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband and likewise, also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Oh, I guess uh, my next thing is still um, in verse 3. The sexual relationship is a gift. As, as I look at Scripture, the, the primary reason for sexual relationship is having children. God created two humans and he wanted lots. He wanted the earth to be overflowing, it says. And so they were going to have to have a sexual relationship, conceive, bear children, and produce the next generation. And of course, especially once death came into the world, we have to do that to keep the whole, the whole race alive. If none of us have any children, we won't continue. But he added into it a whole bunch of other things. And so the relationship between a man and woman is going to be encouraged by a good sexual relationship. Let, let me put it this way. Good sex does not make a good relationship, but a good relationship makes good sex. In fact, I compare the sexual relationship to a thermometer. What's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? You adjust the thermostat. So what does the, what does the thermostat do to the temperature? The thermostat controls the temperature. The thermometer measures the temperature. And if you're struggling in any way in your sexual relationship, unless it's organic stuff where you're simply not understanding each other's bodies or whatever, if you're struggling because you're not wanting that relationship, look elsewhere in your marriage and figure out what's going wrong. There's something wrong in your relationship, and that's why the sexual relationship is not satisfying. Um, just, just go look somewhere else. You can't fix it in bed. You have to fix it outside of the bed and then enjoy the fix in bed. The sexual relationship is a gift. Verse 4 says that the wife has lost, in, a sec in the sexual relationship, she has lost the power, or we could use the word authority, of her own body. In other words, she is not in charge of her body during the sexual relationship. Instead, the husband is. And we reverse it. Likewise, also, the husband has not power or authority of his own body, but the wife. So, in other words, this is such a mutual arrangement that you kind of trade roles in terms of, of uh, not control, but in terms of how you approach the sexual relationship. I counseled a couple one time that were struggling in this area, and I gave them this project, and it helped. I said, I want you to go home, and I want you to make a sign that says his and a sign that says hers. And then I want you to put them on opposite sides of the bed. Put the his sign on her, the side she sleeps on and the hers sign on the side she, he sleeps on. So that when you come to a sexual union, you're thinking, oh, that's right. 
he has authority over her, her, her body and she has authority over his body so that this is a mutually agreeable relationship. It's not, I'm here to get what I can get. I've got the power of my own body, so I'm going to get what I can get out of this. And the wife sitting there, well, I'm going to try to get what I can get out of this. But rather, you are giving to each other. The sexual relationship is a gift. And then verse 5 takes it a step further. It says, defraud ye not the one the other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So if you're not having regular sexual relations, and regular will vary with the couple, can't make any rules about that, but not having regular sexual relations, you are sinning. That sounds pretty strong, but I think that's what it says. It says, don't defraud the other. But notice, it's not defrauding yourself. It's don't defraud the other person. So if I have stopped giving to my wife sexually, I am robbing her of something. If she stops giving to me sexually, she has robbed me of something or defrauded me of something. And the only basis for stopping the sexual relationship, I suppose unless there's some physical things, is we need some time to fast and pray together and this would be a, a, a distraction for what we want to do spiritually. Although, although the sexual relationship is certainly a spiritual part, can be a spiritual part of your life, if you're concentrating on spiritual things, it's better for you to set this side of your, this part of your life aside. But notice, for a time, in other words, it's, a, it's an agreed upon time, and then when the time is up, you come back together again because otherwise Satan is going to tempt you for your lack of self-control. The sexual relationship is meant to bring satisfaction to you as a married person. And if you don't bring that satisfaction, then the door is open for temptation in a lot of different areas. The sexual relationship is a responsibility. <laughs> Does that... I realize this question, if you say yes, I still don't know whether you really understand, but is that kind of a new thought to you? That you're going into the bedroom scene in order to give pleasure to your partner. Now, the way God designed it, you will get pleasure as well, but that should not be your focus. And uh, without getting into a lot of details, this is particularly an issue for the man. Man tends to come to sexual satisfaction sooner than the woman, so if he's not listening to her body, if he's not responding to her needs, he's likely to be satisfied and she's not. I have talked to women who've been married for 30, 40 years who have never been sexually satisfied in their relationship. That's a tragedy, at least if there's not a biological reason. Okay, because it's a duty, because it's a gift, and because it's a responsibility, all forms of pornography, masturbation, adultery, etc., must be removed from your relationship. Now, not everybody that I've talked to, even in, in the biblical counseling world, thinks that these things are that bad, it's particularly masturbation, but uh, it is bad. It will rob you of the intimacy that God created in your marriage. And I can, sp I can speak that out of personal experience because for the first, teen years, first 15 years of our marriage, I was involved in masturbation regularly. And when I got victory over that, our sexual life changed immensely. I didn't think, because she didn't even know about it, I didn't think it was bothering anything. But here's the problem. All of those kinds of sexual uh, activity outside of the marriage are selfish. It's all selfish. Pornography is selfish. Masturbation is selfish. Adultery is selfish. <coughs> uh, even watching a movie because you like the actress or the actor is selfish. You are getting something for yourself and that's the opposite of how God designed the sexual relationship. Sex is for the other person. 
if only one person gets satisfied, you want to make sure it's the other, it's your spouse, not you, in a particular sexual event. They're all selfish. Therefore, sex is a wonderful duty. It's a way to give pleasure. It's a regular relationship, and it's a growing relationship. One of the things that surprised me after when I got married was that we didn't succeed at having sex well right away. Uh, it was To begin with, it seemed like it was a lot of work. Even though there was some pleasure involved, it was a lot of work. We were really struggling to figure out how to fit each other's bodies together and so on. It is a growing relationship. We have a better sexual relationship now. We're past menopause and we've been married 44 years and everything. And we have a better sexual relationship now than we did when we were young squirts. Because we've grown. And I can look back, I, I consider the sexual relationship to be kind of a, a plateau and then a jump and then a plateau and a jump and a plateau and another jump and then another plateau. And I, we can look back at several significant events in our marriage relationship when we began to understand our sexual relationship better or something else in our marriage better. And the result was that we climbed in our ability to enjoy each other um, in that relationship. And, to, and the, the latest one, the one I was just telling you about about five years ago, was that I'm supposed to be giving pleasure to my wife, not just getting pleasure. And even though I worked at that, it wasn't my focus. That's what changed. It became a focus that now, going into the, the relationship, I was looking for ways to make it a happy experience for my wife. It's a way to give pleasure. Okay. We're getting done a little early tonight. Let me give you some verses. I encourage you to put these on your cards. And if you haven't started your cards yet, I encourage you to start your cards. Um, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. We're going to go back to number 7 now with the church. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the words I underlined? One another, one another and ourselves together. That's what church is about. It's about gathering together. First Corinthians, uh, starting I think in chapter 10, Paul is addressing problems there and he says, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together. He says, I don't know, six or seven times in the course of 10, 11, and 12. When you come together, he tells them for something to do when they unite as a body of believers. And so the one another's are very important to that relationship. And if you are negligent in regular attendance, or if you come only to get or you're maybe part of the corporate worship, but you're not a part of a small group, you are missing out on much of what God built into the church relationship. And so I encourage you to look at that, as part of your homework, look at your church attendance and participation and see if you can figure out any ways to improve it. And then these verses we've just been looking at, it's, a long, it's kind of a long passage, but I would encourage you to put it on your cards. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife unto the husband. That's verse 3. Verse 4, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power, that should be over his, body, his own body, but the wife. And then verse 5, defraud ye not the one, the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Actually, I was just noticing... There's a, uh, a tie between the community and the intimacy, isn't it? it? It involves coming together. Different kinds of coming together, but we come together as a church to encourage each other, provoke each other, pray for each other, bless each other, talk to each other, and we come together in the, in the sexual union to give to each other. So here's some projects I wrote out, and they're in the back. Um, add to the, those verses to your verse card. Continue to pray for yourself and your spouse. 
Then review your church attendance and participation. And then list two ways you can improve your church life. It may be being more regular in attendance so that you're part of that one another each Sunday as we come together. It may be that you want to find out, well, we're not a part of a small group, so what kind of small groups are there? And we'd be glad to give you that information and show you how to participate. Uh, or maybe there's something on the outside of those that you can do. Maybe you can start calling another family in the church every week or maybe having somebody over once a month or taking them out to dinner once a month or something so that you're building the one another relationship between you and others in the body of Christ. Switching to the next section, make his or her signs for your bed. That's if, if, that would be a, if that would be helpful to you. It's just a good reminder that I'm coming to give, not to get. And then ask your spouse what pleases her or him in intimacy. I don't know about you, but it took us quite a while before we actually began to talk about the sexual relationship. We'd grown up in the generation that didn't talk about sex. Um, I remember when my dad gave us three older boys the talk. I would have been probably in the ninth grade. I would have had a brother in the eleventh grade and a brother in the seventh grade. Dad sat us down in the living room one time and talked to us about, quote, the birds and the bees. All I remember is that my dad was creasing his pants the whole time that he was talking. He was so nervous. It's the only conversation I ever had about sexuality with him. And I don't remember anything he said, <laughs> so it didn't do any good. Uh, I had to learn my information other places. And by the way, when we got married, there was very little information in books or anything. There's a lot more available now, uh, including one of the books we're going to give away. But uh, have a conversation, either before or during, and say, what pleases you? What, what feels good to you? What, how, what, what draws you to that satisfaction in your intimacy? And I put this under advanced, but these are both good projects. Number one, write a love letter to your spouse. Look up that passage I gave you earlier, and then, if you want to, imitate it. But fill in the details with your own wife or your own husband, but write a love letter. And, I, and I'm thinking about one that's evocative, one that's uh, sexually oriented. You're describing her body or his body, and you're delighted in your letter with his or her body. So write a love letter to your spouse. Then read Song of Solomon together. Talk about what's happening here. But remember, they are talking about each other, not about other people. It's a, it's a relationship uh, book. And then two books that uh, we have, uh, we'll give these away tonight. One is Church Membership by Jonathan Lehman, and then the book Sex, Romance, and the Glory of God by C.J. Mahaney. Now, I've had a suggestion that I think is a good one. All the books that I have recommended in this seminar, we're going to buy a copy and put it in our church library so that if money's an issue, it costs about $100 to buy all the books we've recommended. If money's an issue or you just want to read them one at a time or whatever, they will be in our church library, which is downstairs at the foot of the stairs if you aren't uh, acquainted with that. But uh, um, these are good books and they're handpicked to address the subjects that we've talked about. So the books that we're going to give away tonight, first is Church Membership, so I've got a copy of it there, by a group called Nine Marks, come, comes out of a church in uh, Washington, D.C. They have done some study about how the church functions. Um, the, ori the original book was Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, but they've written this book on church membership. And then C.J. Mahaney, Se Sex, Romance, and the Glory of God. The main thrust of the book is what we talked about tonight. It's a gift to each other. It's not just something you do because you're married. It's not just something you do because you're going to get pleasure out of it. It's something you do so that you can build your relationship and strengthen your relationship because of it. So I have those books here, and I have some names. The first one is Bob and Rain. Which one do you want? <laughs> I, maybe I better do not do that, should I? But that's church membership. We're just going to give them away in order. Otherwise, this might be embarrassing. 
Okay, now the next person doesn't have to be embarrassed to choose this verse or this book. And I have Suzanne Osborne. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have, should have an auction. I don't remember what these two cost, but I think they're in the neighborhood of $10, $12 a piece. I'm really disappointed at the price of books these days. When I went to Bible school, you could buy a hardback book like that for three ninety five or four ninety five, dollars and uh, now you buy a little cheap paperback and it's 15 bucks. Okay, project list, and, and you don't need the course schedule anymore, but the project list is at the door. Any comments or questions as we wrap up this evening? Yes. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, we're never too old to learn. Okay, other comments? Or questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, good, good. Song of Solomon can do that to you as well. Um, let me say this too, that one of the things we have developed as a ministry here is to address specific questions. If you've got something, whether it's church membership or sexuality or anything else we've talked about in this course, and you want to talk about how to make that actually work in your home, then uh, Royce and I and others in the church are available to help you do that. Um, we realize that just giving out information public like this doesn't necessarily solve the problem in, a, in your particular home. You may have some, some twists and turns that need to be evaluated. You may need to learn how to actually make the scripture walk in your life. And so we'd be glad to help you with that. And when we help you, we are helping you as one sinner who's learned a few things to another sinner who needs to learn a few things. So we, one of the books we use in counseling is called... Uh, instruments in a redeemer's hand and the, and the subtitle is people in need of change helping people in need of change <coughs> Royce and I are not beyond learning and growing um, we continue to grow in all areas of our marriage we still struggle to communicate well sometimes we still struggle to overcome to resolve conflict sometimes uh, we still struggle in our sexual relationships sometimes we've gone through about everything you can go through in terms of the cycle of marriage in that area, and some of it's been pretty tough. So we simply share what God has done for us, and then we take you to this book and show you what God has to say about it. And aren't you glad God wrote a book that covered everything that you need to know in marriage, whether it's the sexual life or anything else, communication or whatever, God talked about it. He was not afraid to address it. And I love the fact that the book of Song of Solomon is in the Bible because it means that God also intended for sex to be a lot of pleasure. And he's delighted with that. So, okay. We will close in prayer. Thank you for attending and uh, being part of this. I wish sometimes now that I could go back and teach it over again because having taught through it and lived through it, now I'm thinking, oh, I could have said this and that. But uh, maybe we'll do it again another time. But for now, we just appreciate the fact that you've been here and gained something. And we want to just close by asking God to bless your marriages and to help you take these things and put them into practice. Father, we do thank you that you have blessed us with marriage. And Lord, this room represents a dozen or so marriages. Each one is unique. Each one has aspects to it that nobody else knows about. 
Each one has difficulties. Each one has joys. Lord, I just want to ask you as our Heavenly Father to bless each of these couples in their marriages and in their homes and their parenting, to bless them in their communication, in their church attendance, participation in their sexual lives and their problem solving and especially in them keeping you at the center of their home. I ask for you to do a supernatural work in each of their homes so that they can become a picture of Christ in the church to our community. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Thank you. I, w I would, yeah, let me, let me say just a word about that. There's a conference in Bozeman, August 2 through 4, I think is the dates. First, first weekend in August, it'd be a Thursday through Saturday, Thursday noon through Saturday noon. Uh, between now and the end of May, it's only $40, or no, it's $80 um, per person registration. If we can get, if we have 11 people, one person goes free, or we cut the rate for everybody. But... Um, what they talk about is the kinds of things we're talking about here. They, they take the scripture and apply it to our lives in all kinds of di different practical areas. My preaching became far more practical when I trained as a counselor because I began to get exposed to practical, practical Bible teaching instead of just theoretical Bible teaching. So I'd encourage you to think about that. We, we'll actually uh, be doing some announcements about it um, probably when we get back. But just keep that in mind. August 2 to 4, Thursday noon to Saturday noon. And uh, it's in Bozeman, Montana. We took a, how many did it went last time? 17 or 18, I think. Uh, we had a wonderful time together uh, as well as a wonderful time of learning. There's two tracks. One, if you're a beginner in these things, there's a, a track there. If you've had some experience in counseling, well, then there's um, a separate track for that. Okay? Get home and get a good night's rest. And do whatever you like ahead of the rest. <laughs>